Chapter 5, Z-Scores, Location of Scores in Standardized Distributions, Part 4. So in this um, part of the lecture, we're going to focus on how we can use Z-Scores as a way of applying inferential statistics. So again, inferential statistics refers to the process of using sample statistics or sample data to draw conclusions about a population. So up until now, we've um, been focusing on the use of z-scores applicable to populations. But the same can be used for samples, and, and in doing so, we will be able to engage in inferential statistics. So populations are the most common context for computing z-scores. For example, looking at um, computing a z-score of someone's IQ. Um, which will enable us to express that person's IQ in relation to the mean of all IQ scores. So you may um, sometime in your life hear someone say that you are three standard deviation units, um, which implies that you're very different from the norm, from the average of whatever uh, the characteristic is that you're talking about. So we can um, apply all that we've learned thus far in relation to population and use it to understand the implications of z-scores when applied to a sample. So it is possible to compute a z-score for samples. In fact, I've already presented the equations um, to do so in a previous lecture. So for a sample, z is equal to x minus m right, over s. So again, the, um, the structure is the same and the variables um, represented are the same, but the notation is different because we're using a sample versus a population. And also, if we want to convert an x, um, a z-score back into an x value, the equation is x is equal to the mean of the sample plus the product of the z-score multiplied by the standard deviation. So again, the, the structure is the same, it's just the notation that's different when we're using um, z-scores for a sample. So again, um, the purpose of a z-score is to indicate the exact location of a score in relation to the mean. So it indicates relative position of score in a sample, and it indicates the distance from the sample mean. Again, the sign tells us if we're above or below the mean, and the value indicates how many standard deviation units that particular score is from the mean. Now, at this point, we are strictly talking about scores in relation to the mean, but we're going to move um, towards this idea of samples compared to the population mean um, when we get into chapter 7. And the reason for that is because we, we wouldn't conduct um, good research using just one data point. We need a collection of data points so that we can draw conclusions about a population. But we're going to learn about that step by step by first looking at scores and then using that information and applying it to converting sample averages into z-scores. So in a, sample, a sample distribution can be transformed into z-scores. And again, the shape of the distribution remains the same. And we have the same mean and standard deviation um, for, for m and s. So again, if it were we're converting all x values of a sample into z-scores, um, then the mean of the distribution is still zero and the standard deviation is still equal to one. So looking ahead to inferential statistics, um, the interpretation of research results depends on determining if a sample is noticeably different from the population. So again, the treated sample. So we'll have instances where we may be comparing a sample to a population, if we're lucky enough to have population parameters available to us, or we may be comparing samples to samples. Um, one sample is represented with the untreated population, and one sample is exposed to the treatment, which stems from the in manipulation of the independent variable. So once a treatment is administered and we are able to, to make comparisons, we want to know is, is the group that received treatment noticeably different? So we need to define what we mean by noticeably different. So one technique for defining noticeably different is to use z-scores. And um, we've seen in our text this idea of, you know, one standard deviation unit above and below. That represents the majority of scores. 70% of scores are going to fall within that region. And again, 
based on our understanding of frequency that makes sense. The highest percentage of scores are occurring around the mean, that most scores are similar to the mean in a normal distribution. And we know that we can go out three um, standard deviation units above and below the mean to capture the majority um, or almost all of the scores. We would capture approximately 99% of all scores, three standard deviation units out. But we tend to think anything that's beyond a z-score of two, beyond a z-score of two is um, expressing something that's different from the mean, that it's noticeably different, that it no longer falls in that common region. And we, as researchers, have to determine is the difference that we see due to chance, sampling error, or is it due to the fact that the treatment was effective? And we'll learn how to um, statistically make that determination, but for now we understand that noticeably different implies two standard deviation, two or more standard deviation units away from the mean. Again, if something is close to the mean, it means it's similar to the mean. If it deviates from the mean, then it's indicating that it's different from the mean. So here's a visual of what we are going to engage in or what we can apply uh, when we engage in, in research. So oh, we usually hypothesize about some original population without treatment. And then we select, and again, this is denoted by M, this, the population size. And then we take a sample, um, a smaller subset, preferably representative of the population. It's just smaller in size. The proportions and all the characteristics that are demonstrated in the population are simply in, in a smaller um, ratio than they appear in the larger population. So it's a, a small mini population per se. So we have our sample. We expose that sample to treatment um, and then we analyze that treatment. And one, I, one um, method of research says that then we compare, compare treated sample to untreated population. And we'll learn about this when we engage in a z-score test. Um, and this requires that we have population parameters. So we have to have the information about the population to do this kind of comparison. But here we took a subset of the sample of the population um, and used a sample to expose it to treatment and then we're going to compare is the end result and normally it's the mean that we're comparing the average score um, of the treated population compares to the population parameter the mu the average of the untreated population and then we decide you know is this noticeably different are they different in to determine that, we would calculate a z-score of that sample mean and see if it indeed is beyond two standard deviation units from um, the population mean. And a little precursor to what we'll be um, setting later is this idea that in, if we don't have population parameters available, we would take a sample and that would be the untreated sample. So again, if we don't have population parameters, we can just take a sample that is then deemed as the untreated sample. And in the, then when we take a sample, so notice that we have two samples that are being compared to one another. When we treat one sample, then it's a comparison of this group, right, compared to this group. And so again, one sample is um, serving as a representation of the untreated population and the other sample receives treatment and so then we compare the two to see if there is a difference between the two groups. So these are different methods by which we can draw comparisons. Again, in most cases we're not going to have access to population parameters so in most statistical tests we will find or use a sample to um, mimic or serve the place of the population and then we treat the other sample so that we can draw comparisons to see if the manipulation of the independent variable was effective. 
So let's um, put this to work for us. Um, in chapter five, uh, there's example 5.11, and it outlines this research of testing a growth hormone on um, rats. So we have a population of adult rats, and we're told that the average weight of the untreated population of rats is equal to 400 grams. So that's the average weight of a normal rat, lab rat. Um, and we want to determine if um, a growth hormone has an effect on the weight of um, these rats. And um, the, an additional piece of information that we're given is that the standard deviation is equal to 20 grams. So again, by definition, that says that the majority of, of um, adult rats weigh 400 grams, but there's variation in that weight, and on average, these rats deviate from this average of 400 on average by 200 grams, oh, excuse me, 20 grams. So again, we're understanding that um, from the center here, right, and if we were to go up 20 grams, that puts us at a score of 420, right? Because we would take one standard deviation unit is equal to 20 points added to the mean, and we understand that that's equal to 420. Um, also on the negative side, or the values below the mean, that places us at a weight of 380, 380 grams. So again, the majority or 70% of adult rats are gonna weigh between 300 and 80 grams all the way to 420 grams. So that's where most of adult rats weigh. So that's the range, the normal range. Again, the majority at 400 grams, but there's some deviation. But within that deviation, we have approximately 70% of rats weighing between 380 and 420 grams. Okay, so next what um, these researchers did was take one one rat at birth and begin injecting it with this growth hormone. And once it reached um, adulthood, then that rat was weighed and to determine if the growth hormone was effective. So we administer the growth hormone to one rat and in the end, their adult weight is 100, 418 grams. And before I go any further, what I wanna do is is use this as an example of um, demonstrating what the research and the null hypothesis would be as, as well as identifying the independent dependent variable. So here I've identified what the null hypothesis would say. Again, the notation for the null is H sub zero. The growth hormone has an effect on growth, um, or we could say weight, right? Growth that's denoted by weight if we wanna be um, more specific. So the growth is in relation to the weight because that's what we're measuring in the end. And the research hypothesis states that, um, again, the notation is H sub one, the growth hormone does have an effect on weight. So again, the null always says nothing's happening, does not have an effect. And the research is saying something is happening, it does have an effect, so note the difference between the two. The independent variable is the thing that we're manipulating, so it's the growth hormone. So we're gonna administer that to one rat. Normally we'd administer it to a sample, but this is just an illustration of how we convert one X value into a Z-score to determine if this is noticeably different. And the dependent variable is the weight. That's what we're gonna measure in the end. So again, here's that same graph illustrating the mean in the center. Um, so again, the mean of the Adult rats is 400 grams, and we had a standard deviation equal to 20 grams. And we indicated that we took one rat at birth and administered this growth hormone and at adulthood. When it reached adulthood, it weighed 418 grams. So we're gonna use this value to determine if this is noticeably different, meaning was the independent variable, the growth hormone, effective in significantly increasing weight. So we would convert that to a z-score. So we take x minus mu and divide by our standard deviation. 
and our Z is equal to 418, 418 grams minus the average of 14, 400 grams over 20 grams. So our Z score, okay, in our calculator is 418 minus 400, that's equal to 18, divide by 20, our Z score is equal to 0.9. So in other words, an X value of 418 is 0.9 standard deviation units above the mean. It's a little less than one standard deviation unit. Again, I indicated that this area constitutes 70% of um, adult rat's weight. So it's, it's within that common range. Uh, we would consider this to be not very noticeably different, that it's, it's still within that range of, of um, being represented by this average weight of 400. So in this case, we wouldn't have enough evidence to say that this growth hormone had a significant effect on weight, that once this growth hormone was administered, the end result was really no different than the average. And the difference that we obtained of 418 grams is just simply due to chance um, and that perhaps the genetic makeup of this rat to begin with tended to be a little bit larger than the than the norm than the average In the next scenario, I apologize if there was a bit of a pause there. Um, the next scenario relates to um, a rat, again, taken at birth and, and given this growth hormone. And in the end, when that rat reaches adulthood, it weighs 450 grams. So again, these are two different scenarios. And they're just um, conducting research on one rat at a time and now they're saying this particular rat now weighs 450 grams so again we want to find out is that noticeably different from the norm we convert that score into a z score so z is equal to x minus mu over standard deviation z is equal to 450 minus 400 over 20 so in our calculators 450 minus 400 gives us 50 divide by 20 and we get a z-score equal to 2.5 so a weight of 450 grams is 2.5 two and a half standard deviation units from the mean of this distribution so one two and then a half so the score of 450 is two and a half standard deviation units above and again we had indicated that this idea of noticeably different is defined by values that are beyond two standard deviation units. So this falls into that, what we would refer to as extreme or noticeably different. And this is giving us evidence to indicate um, we have support for the research hypothesis. The research hypothesis indicates that the growth hormone will have an effect on weight. And because, of the, because the weight of this particular rat was significantly higher than the norm outside of that common region, then we would have support for that. Um, what, whether we reject the null hypothesis is contingent upon conducting this research on a sample. We wouldn't draw these conclusions by using one data point. But this is just um, the illustration of how we would convert an X value into a Z score to again understand this idea of noticeably different. In inferential statistics we're going to actually use a collection of X values, a sample, right? We would normally take a sample of let's say 50 rats and administer this whole growth hormone and then measure the average of the weight of those who received the treatment and compare it to the untreated population. Same process, but again in this case we're just working with X values. 
But again, this particular rat shows that it's very different in weight compared to the norm, and so we have some support for this idea that the growth hormone was effective, opposed to the other rat that only weighed 418 grams after receiving treatment. So this is the basis of inferential statistics. Again, at this point we're just using X values, but come chapter 7 we'll be using um, samples to draw these conclusions and these comparisons. And it'll all be grounded in this idea of probability. What is the chance that um, we would select a sample of um, untreated rats and they weighed on average 450 grams? The likelihood that a sample of untreated rats weighing 450 grams is pretty unlikely. So again, given the um, distribution of weights here, and we see the tail tapering off over here, that the frequency is indicating there are very few rats that weigh 450 grams. So the likelihood of selecting a sample of untreated rats weighing on average 450 grams is is very improbable, very unlikely, and therefore we would have great support for this idea that the um, research, the growth hormone was effective. So that's where we're moving with these ideas of a z-score indicating the distance, standardized distance from the mean so that we can compare and determine if the independent variable, the manipulation of the independent variable has shown some effect. And we'll end with the learning check. Um, this is similar to the example I gave you of uh, Mary and Esther and their statistics exam one scores. So you will be given these types of questions to assess your understanding of converting unlike distributions onto um, one common distribution, the Z distribution, to make fair comparisons. So last week, Andy uh, had exams in chemistry and in Spanish. On the chemistry exam, the mean was 30 and the standard deviation was equal to 5. And Andy scored a 45. On his Spanish exam, the mean was 60 with a standard deviation of 6. And Andy scored a 65 on that exam. For which class should Andy expect a better grade? In other words, which exam did he perform um, better? And what we need to do is first recognize that these are two distinctly different distributions because of the fact that they have different averages and different standard deviations. So comparing them at face value, the score of 45 compared to a score of 65 is inappropriate. Um, it's comparing apples to oranges, so we need to convert them into Z scores for us to make a fair comparison. So we're going to convert the first score in the chemistry test. So Z is equal to X minus mu over standard deviation. So Z is equal to 30, uh, excuse me, 45 minus 30 divided by the standard deviation of 5. So we get a score of, um, well, a value of 45 minus 30, 15 over 5, and we get 3. So in comparison to his peers, he did quite well. Again, this idea of noticeably different. Um, if we plot this out, we can have the mean of the exam equal to 30, standard deviation equal to 5, and his score of 45 right, is one, two, three standard deviation units from the mean, positive three standard deviation units above the mean, which is significant in showing that he did much better than the norm. He did much better than his peers in that particular class. So let's consider the other distribution and the other z-score. So z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation. Z is equal to his Spanish test score was 65, and the average was 60, and he, um, the standard deviation is equal to 6. So we have 65 minus 60 gives us 5, divide by 6. And we get a... a proportion 0.83 and we'll learn that um, well for z-scores they're reported two digits right at the decimal um, the hundredth place so we'll learn to use our rounding appropriate rounding rules to cut off um, our z-scores 
And again, this is indicating that he was pretty similar to the, the norm, that his Spanish exam score did not deviate significantly from the norm. So we have a norm demonstrated by a score of 60. That was the average score. And standard deviation is, is equal to 6. So one standard deviation unit puts us at 66. And his score of 65 was right about here. Score of 65. So it's equivalent to a z-score of 0.83. So again, showing that it's not noticeably different, um, very close to the average score. So we would conclude that um, he would expect a better grade or just on this particular exam, he did much better on his chemistry test because he scored three standard deviation units above the mean. So again, this example helps to illustrate how we take two dissimilar distributions, place them on one distribution, a Z distribution, so that we can draw fair comparisons between the two. So again, the original distribution for chemistry here and Spanish here were converted to a Z distribution and now we we're able to make a fair comparison once we've converted both raw scores into Z scores. So a score of three was the chem score and a score of 0.83 was for Spanish. So again, we placed them on one common distribution and we can see the one that's further from the mean on the positive side would denote a higher score. So again, taking apples and oranges, converting them to pairs, one common distribution so that we can make fair comparisons of two dissimilar original distributions and two X values coming from distinctly different distributions. And this last, uh, or this learning check reinforces um, the concepts that we've been presented in this um, chapter. So transforming an entire distribution of scores into Z-scores will not change the shape of the distribution. And this is true. We've, we've discussed it when we were converting scores in a population, and the same um, characteristic is applicable when we transform scores in a sample. So the shape of the distribution remains the same. Again, the Z-score is simply a new label for that original X-score. So the location does not change. It's now simply expressed in standard deviation units above or below the mean opposed to raw score um, difference above or below the mean. The next one, true or false, if a sample of 10 scores is transformed into z-scores, there will be five positive z-scores and five negative z-scores. And this, is, in general, is false. It, it could be possible, but um, we wouldn't expect um, an even distribution of scores above and below the mean. The number of scores above and below the mean will be exactly the same um, in relation to the original distribution. So we may have eight scores above the mean and two scores below. Again, it's um, dependent on what the original distribution looks like. So we, we should not expect an even distribution of z-scores above and below the mean of a population or sample distribution of z-scores. And that concludes the lectures for Chapter 5. And all of this information will um, help us better understand the concepts of probability, which will be presented in Chapter 6 and be inevitable uh, or, or essential, excuse me, essential in understanding Chapter 7 when we discuss the distribution of sample means. So this is all um, introduction to what, uh, what we're going to be exposed to in Chapter 7 when we start to really engage in, in inferential statistics.